Hello everybody, I hope you can all hear me. I don't know if you can or not, coming to you from the beautiful shores of Tadafati. Welcome and welcome to the webinar series in Aotearoa with our conference adapted vision. Um, I will just, yep, I hope everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me now? It's good. All right. We're going to go, go for it now and welcome the wonderful people to share information and they would have shared it face to face with everybody. And it was such a shame that we had to adapt. But you know what? New Zealanders are good at adapting and you're good at adapting with us. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, to listen, to hear and to be part of this conversation. And also it's International Day of Older Persons. So I want you to go out there after this and say hello to somebody who's older welcome to somebody who's older and actually happy international day of older persons but thank you for joining us today we've got two hours jam-packed full of entertainment wonderful speakers to listen to and wonderful thought-provoking conversations so we're going to start by saying thank you to our perpetual guardian our platinum sponsor for making this happen without them we wouldn't be able to zoom around new zealand um, in people's into people's offices into people's lounges into people's workplaces to be able to talk so today we are going to thank them profusely as well as thank our speakers this webinar series is one of uh, several throughout october i hope you join us each time for each of the one we conversations we're going to have the, today the proceedings the way it's going to work and um um, be with me while we go through this because this is the first time I've done this. This is the first time I've ever been part of a webinar series of this of this size, but part of a webinar series that brings information out to you all. So we're going to go through a few speakers. As I said, we're going to start with the wonderful Margaret Broad and Ministry of Health. We're going to go on to the distinguished Paul, Professor Paul Spoonley. And then we're going to hear from Greg, Greg Ward, who was, we were going to see all face to face in October, which was today, of course, but we are now going to see us by the screens. Uh, we are then going to uh, be assigned a breakout session. And in that breakout session, you can then have more conversations, thought provoking things, ideas of what you're going to take away from this session make, and make happen. So my housekeeping today is please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off while you're watching the presentations. It must, it's, it's you know how hard it is when things are distracting. After the presentations, you will be given an invitation to join the breakout sessions, and then the breakout sessions will be commenced. You'll be assigned those breakout sessions once you've identified you want to be part of it. In the breakout sessions, though, turn your microphones back on, leave your cameras on, and you can have that conversation with the people in the space. After the breakout sessions, we're going to then close down we're going to all come back together and we're going to have a closing statement so uh, and we're going to share um, we're going to we're going to we're going to be so excited to have spent the last two hours together hearing about what's going on in New Zealand so I uh, welcome and would like to welcome um, the Margaret Broadcorn the Chief Nursing Officer of the Ministry of Health I know it's a busy time for you. I know there's lots going on. And so thank you so much for taking time to welcome us today. Oh, kia ora koutou katoa, a tēnā koe, Stephanie. Uh, kia ora koutou, ngā mihi mahana uh, ki a koutou katoa. A nau mai haere mai ki tēnei kaupapa, uh, ko mā broodkorn uh, tōko ingoa, he mahi uh, no hokianga ahau, uh, he mahi ana ahau, uh, he tāpoi rangatera o manatū haora. Again, thank you, Stephanie, uh, for the introduction and, and the honour of um, providing the opening address for your webinar series, uh, Vision for Ageing in Aotearoa. Um, as uh, Stephanie said, I'm the Chief Nursing Officer at the Ministry of Health and am so privileged and honoured to be here today uh, to open uh, uh, this series. If I can congratulate, uh, firstly congratulate and congratulations to the New Zealand Association of Gerontology and Aged Care, Aged Concern New Zealand for convening the webinar. 
in our series. It is ever so appropriate that the first in the series is held, uh, the first of the series is held today on the 1st of October, the International Day of Older Persons. Today also being the 30th anniversary of the United Nations designated International Day of Older Persons. The theme of the 2020 International Day of Older Persons is pandemics. Do they change how we address age and ageing? This day highlights the role of the healthcare workforce in contributing to the health of older people. It it's specifically recognises the nursing profession, acknowledging that this year is the World Health Organization's designated International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. Could I take a moment though to pause and recognise all our nurses, our midwives, all of our healthcare workers and volunteers, inclusive of volunteers, um, who have proactively responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically to those globally 7,000 healthcare workers who have lost their lives in the course of duty. My aroha um, goes out and is extended to all those families in whānau who have lost their loved ones as a result of COVID-19. 2020 is a year like no other, and many of us have anticipated a very different year which changed extremely rapidly. While COVID-19 has made its mark in 2020, we continue to focus on other key health priorities as we commence a new decade. It is also the beginning of the World Health Organization's decade of healthy ageing from 2020 to 2030. The WHO has developed a decade of healthy ageing, a decade of healthy ageing action plan, the second action plan of the global strategy on ageing and health. The WHO's Director General will report back regularly on progress on its implementation um, plan every three years during this decade. So it is appropriate then that the New Zealand Association of Gerontology and the Age Concern New Zealand are taking the opportunity through, through this uh, webinar series to reflect on the vision for ageing in Aotearoa as we respond to the challenge of COVID-19 and the high risk that the pandemic poses for older people. Those of us attending will know, and no doubt Professor Paul, uh, Paul Spoonley will shortly highlight in his upcoming presentation, that New Zealand's population is growing and ageing. Over the next decade, the numbers and diversity of older people will increase significantly. The proportions of older Māori, Pacific, and particularly older Asian people are expected to grow most significantly here in Aotearoa. You'll also be well aware that older people are more likely to have a disability and to have more than one health condition. The health system needs to be prepared so it can keep up with um, the changing needs and expectations of our aging population. We want a health system that supports people to live longer, but also to spend more of that life in good health. And if I could share from a personal perspective, my mum turned 86 this week, and I'm so proud of the fact that although she is slowing down a little bit, both physically and cognitively, she has better eyesight than I have, and is still pretty sharp and witty. She thought, actually it was hilarious on Monday when it was her birthday, she thought it was hilarious when I pointed out to her that her hair is actually darker than mine. Um, for instance, you know, my hair is literally 95% grey and she's got less than 50%, which seems a bit unfair. So, but she thought that I got this hair colour from the hairdresser, so bless, bless my mum. So mum is still fiercely independent and wants to remain so as long as she is able to. As, as, and which is what we want for all of our, um, our older people, our queer and kaumatua. Therefore, having access to appropriate services in order for her to maintain that independence is so important to her and for us as a whānau. The New Zealand Healthy Ageing Strategy of 2016 is intended to drive the health system to have a greater focus on supporting healthy ageing, being more age-friendly and actively supporting older people to, people to live well, whatever their age or health condition. Alongside the strategy, the need to address equity is a priority for the government, for the Ministry of Health and the health system. Central to this is improving our responsiveness to diversity, in particular the needs of Māori, Pacific, disabled people and those rural, remote and isolated. Māori and Pacific populations are likely to experience age-related risk of COVID-19 earlier than the average age of 70, partly because chronic health conditions are also often expected at an earlier age. COVID-19 has brought unprecedented challenges and changes. The critical importance of nurses and other healthcare workers has been brought sharply into focus during this pandemic. For nurses and healthcare workers, this has meant working together and collaboratively and rather urgently. Staff across the health and disability system has found themselves working in unfamiliar environments, across boundaries and with new procedures. 
stringent measures have been put in place to avoid transmission in the community and to patients and residents and to vulnerable staff. The pandemic has highlighted vulnerable communities um, of our aged care communities, Māori, Pacific, peoples and, and rural environments. It has meant taking services directly to whānau and communities. The pandemic has also highlighted, highlighted that within the aged care sector, including home and community support services, there are high numbers of older workers when, with underlying health conditions. A number of people identified themselves at risk and took appropriate action, and others chose to continue working. We honour those people. Aged care and home community support services providers undertook vulnerable workforce risk, risk assessments to identify workers and the support that they needed. Everyone has a part to play in to protect residents of aged care facilities, including residents, family, friends and staff, and all of our whānau, all of our older whānau in the community. The impact of COVID-19 is ongoing and enduring, requiring longer term planning and oversight of the response. I'm so proud of our New Zealand healthcare system and our response. It was shocking to hear that overseas, when we've heard news of aged care facilities and our older people and older people being abandoned, we know that that, that didn't happen here in New Zealand and we responded accordingly. A joined up approach across health and social sectors and government and non-government sectors has always and continues to be incredibly important to coordinate assistance to older people, especially those who are socially isolated and vulnerable. And, um, and vulnerable. This webinar series contributes to that response. You have, an exciting, you have exciting, some exciting sessions coming up in this webinar series, not only today with Professor Paul Spoonley on why ageing is central to a present and future New Zealand, and then Greg Ward on moments, um, moments that matter, the power of now. And I look forward to, to hearing more over the following weeks and with the different uh, presenters that you have. So with an impressive lineup and um, lineup of topics and speakers, the care of our older people, our queer, our kaumatua are in good hands. And I want to thank you all for, for all that you do to keep our elders, our queer and kaumatua safe, enhancing and maintaining their independence and meeting their needs. While 2020 has provided us with some challenges, I truly believe that Aotearoa is our God zone and that we are kept safe on a whole lot of levels. And on that note, I wish you well for this month and the series of webinars. Keep safe, keep kind and keep smiling. So I will go now and go and hug some older people, as Stephanie has encouraged. Kia ora koutou, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Kia ora, Mar Margaret, thank you so much for that and such great words um, around how we feel, um, what's going on in the world and what's going on in New Zealand, how, how wonderfully we have done over this year. This year has been an unusual year. Um, it has been an unusual year for many of us and we have to remind ourselves that actually next year will come soon enough and we need to respect and say, and say goodbye to this year. I thank you so much and keep and don't be so busy. I know that there's so much going on. Mm, kia ora. Thank you, Stephanie. So now we've actually got one of our most thought-provoking speakers that I know I've heard before and every time I've listened to speaking, listening, finished listening to Paul, I've always thought, what, how did he know that? How did he pose that difficult question? And what does that mean for me? So I'd like to introduce the distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley, who heads up a major research project on capturing the diverse dividend of Aotearoa and is just beginning another project on societal resilience. He is the editor of, or, and author of 27 books and another New Zealand uh, dem demography, demography coming out soon. My apologies. This book has convinced him that New Zealand authorities and communities do not understand the effects of demographic disruption that is now occurring, including the nature of ageing. What a wonderful thing ageing is. So yes, it is an interesting thing. A, po a policy priority is ageing well. Ageing well where you choose to age well, ageing well how you choose to age. But we are really doing, and are we really doing enough for this? And I think he's going to ask that question today. Politically, are we doing enough for this? So please, let's listen to Paul. Grab a cup of tea, make yourself comfortable. We're here for a ride. Um, nā mihi kia koutou, nā mihi kia koe, Stephanie. Thank you for the introduction. Nā mana nā reo e nā waka. 
Una mana fena wa tena koto we hilma kura mai no tena koto tena koto kura tata katoa. Um, it is a real honour to be one of the opening speakers for this Vision for Ageing in Aotearoa webinar series. And I want to acknowledge, as Margaret did, the Age Concern in New Zealand Association of Gerontology. Um, can we have the first slide, please? Um, so as you can see, my, my uh, argument is really around the centrality of ageing in New Zealand. And what I want to do is, is inject some urgency into the debates because as Stephanie has said, my concern is that even though this conference demonstrates, this webinar demonstrates the, the depth and uh, diversity of people who are working in this space of aging and its various manifestations, my concern is one that we as a society and politically are really not in, um, engaging with the, 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 the massive change that is occurring to our society. Next slide, please. So this is the um, this is the uh, cover of the book, and as you can see here, I've got a quote from Sarah Harper, which is the um, central argument of the book, and that is that demography disrupts. And I, my question really today is: Is demography destiny? And my answer is not necessarily so. We have options, but as you can see, part of what I'm arguing is that we really have not considered in a way that I think is um, adequate the demographic disruption that is occurring. So alongside the disruption that is the product of the fourth um, uh, industrial revolution, what I want to put on the agenda is the disruption that demography is concerned, is, is now generating. Um, recently, The Economist uh, on the 29th of August had a special report on dementia and the tagline there was, nowhere in the world, nowhere in the world is ready to cope with the global explosion of dementia. Now there was a, uh, an extensive discussion of the clinical aspects of dementia, and I'm in no way qualified to talk about that. But what they did point out was that with the increased lifespan, there is an expen exponential growth, in this case in dementia. And it's that exponential growth that uh, is really going to be challenging for us. So what I want to start by saying is that over the uh, last decade, 2010 to 2020, we've begun to see the foundations of the new society that's emerging, and that will really generate a very significant change over the next decade, 2020 to 2030. And are we prepared for it? And in this case, are we prepared for the aging of society? Next slide, please. So, here, here, is, here is what I am anticipating, and that first element is the inversion of the population pyramid. When I was growing up, 8% of the population were aged over 65. Now, can I just note here that 65, there's nothing sacrosanct about the age of 65. In fact, it's becoming increasingly irrelevant, and perhaps its only um, significance is that it is the age of superannuation eligibility. But it's, it's generally used, and so I'm going to stick with that. And so we're going to hit a tipping point quite soon. And many parts of New Zealand have already um, met this tipping point, and that the population aged over 65 is going to be larger than the 0 to 15 years of age. So we're inverting that, um, that pyramid. So when I was growing up as a baby boomer, 8% of my community were aged over 65. And Quite soon as a country, 25% of the population will be aged over 65. In recent years, and remember that our population growth has been very, very high since 2013. Three quarters of that population growth has been uh, driven by immigration. So we're, we're starting to see this um, change that's occurring. And I want to talk briefly about some of those changes. But the aging of New Zealand and of regional Aotearoa is one of the major characteristics of this country that we live in. Next slide, please. So in 10 years, 2030, um, first of all, uh, we already have over half of the New Zealand population living in the Upper North Island. So Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Bay of Plenty. Uh, but about 40% of those uh, will be living in Auckland. 
Um, the immigration that we've seen since 2000, and particularly since 2013, means that uh, another tipping point will be met where the, those who self-identify in Asian communities will outnumber Māori. So for all of us who are thinking about ageing, the ethnic diversity of this country is important. And that might mean the uh, communities that are ageing, but it also might mean those communities that will provide care of one sort or another. And of course, there is a very significant issue here, and that is that the Māori life expectancy is not anywhere near the same as a Pākehā, and there are some inequities and some outcomes that relate to Māori which should not be accepted anymore. I've already talked about the tipping point of the older age groups outnumbering the youngers, but what I also want to come back to is the regional differentiation here. Many regions are already experiencing population stagnation. Their populations are not growing. Some regions, the central North Island, the west coast of the South Island, are already experiencing population decline. But alongside both of those experiences of stagnation and decline, the regional populations are experiencing aging. I'm doing some work in central Otago and in the area in which I am uh, working already the over 65s are significantly larger proportion of the population than the under 15. So already they've met that tipping point and they're facing a very significantly different future. And the question I've got is a broad one and a political one. Are we prepared for that? Next slide. So can I just rehearse the other elements of this demographic change? One is that alongside aging, we've got declining fertility. So we've gone from that very high fertility that we saw in the 1950s, the start of the baby boom period, to now a sub-replacement rate, which we met in 2017. I'm going to come back to this, but all expectations are that COVID-19 will reduce the fertility even further partly because of the, un economic, the economic uncertainty, but also partly because do you want to bring a child into a world in which COVID-19 is still quite rampant? The generation that is most affected by this are millennials, and millennials encountered these economic difficulties in the um, uh, global financial crisis 2008 to 2013, but they're now encountering them again. And so that generation choosing uh, not to have children, or to have one child, the one and done. And of course, what um, is hidden there in the slide, unfortunately, is that um, the involvement of female, uh, females in the labor force and their education, alongside the cost of having children, uh, is significant. The cost there, by the way, um, is being calculated from two different sources, and is the cost of raising a child to the age of 17. Uh, it's quite a bit lower in New Zealand uh, than it is in many other countries, but as you can see, the direct and indirect costs are not insignificant. Thank you, next slide. And the second thing is that uh, what we've done is generate population growth by, through immigration. And in the, um, the year, the 12 months to June this year, 2020, we saw 160,000 permanent and long-term, uh, which is the PLA there, arrive, which gave us a net gain of 80,000. Uh, that is almost double the net gain per head of population as Australia, and it is three to four times higher than most OECD countries. So it's very, very high. Of course, it's come to a grinding halt. And then we've got 300,000 temporary migrants. Why is this important? Well, when you look at the elder care workforce of around 30,000, about 10,000 of those are on some sort of migrant visa, sometimes temporary, sometimes permanent. So it does matter, and I'll come back to that. And then, of course, the, um, uh, that we've got industries and employers who are now very reliant on, on immigrant skills. So we've, we've, we've got a big debate ahead of us around immigration. Next slide, please. And then, of course, there is the third, the different regional experiences when it comes to uh, these population dynamics, this new demography. 
And as you can see there, uh, already many regions are experiencing population stagnation. And through this decade, we expect two thirds of New Zealand regions to experience that population stagnation. It does mean that in many regions, uh, the, the major towns will grow, but the areas around them will not. So if you take Hawke's Bay, Hastings, Napier and Havelock North will certainly grow, uh, but already Wairoa, Waipukarao and Waipawa are experiencing either stagnation or population decline, and they are aging communities. So it is going to become a particular issue in terms of our regional communities and our regional towns and it will ask some very profound questions. This new demography will ask some very profound questions about how we provide services and support, how we get a workforce in these regions, given these, um, these demographic changes. Next slide. And that's what it looks like. That's what growth through to 2031 looks like. You can see Auckland dominating and the growth in Auckland increasing. I've put an arrow alongside Waikato and Bay of Plenty because both of those regions are growing, but essentially Hamilton and Tauranga are growing. And then I've uh, also arrowed Otago because of course, what we are seeing is the impacts of COVID-19, particularly on Queenstown, which has driven a lot of that growth. And so I would anticipate a very significant reversal from these projections simply because we won't see growth in Queenstown and Queenstown Lakes in the way that we have. Thank you. Next slide. So let's come to the, the issues of ageing. And I want to rehearse both the demography, but also some of the challenges. Some of the challenges that I've chosen are quite selective. I just want to highlight some of the challenges that we're going to face. Can I just um, characterise how we as demographers and sociologists would describe what is occurring? Um, firstly, we are seeing structural ageing. So that means that the proportion of the population who are aged over 65 in this case is changing quite fundamentally. Uh, it will reach 25% in the next decade. So um, the baby boomers began to arrive at the age of 65 in 2010. Uh, in the 2013 census, uh, there were about 600,000 um, aged over 65. And within the next decade, we will see over 1 million people aged over 65 in New Zealand, eventually reaching uh, 1.2 million. And that means that we are seeing the numbers, the numerical aging of the population. So structure plus the numerical aging. Alongside that, we are seeing increased longevity. And I want to come back to this because there's new ways of calculating this. But in terms of best practice and calculating um, the life expectancy of New Zealanders, what's interesting is that we're seeing a decade on decade increase in the longevity of that life with no indication at this point of a leveling off of that increasing longevity. But alongside that, the baby boomers are, are, are recreating, reinventing, aging. They're doing aging in quite different ways. And so I will always say that the uh, baby boomers are, are the healthiest and wealthiest of any New Zealand generation that, will, that has reached age 65. And that's to acknowledge that a number of the people who are age 65 or over are experiencing all sorts of difficulties. Um, but as a generation, uh, certainly we are doing aging, I'm a baby boomer, we're doing aging in, in quite different ways. Alongside that, we're having to reconsider many of the tipping points that uh, we would look at in terms of demography, and you, many of you as um, healthcare providers uh, would also be looking at this. Um, we are, over the last 30 years, we have had to increase the age at which we would normally expect fragility and dependence to kick in by approximately 10 years. So that too indicates how we are aging differently. Um, can I um, go back and just talk about longevity? Um, 
the, the people that are reaching age 65 are going to live longer and longer. The generations that follow them will increase that uh, longevity that we are going to experience. Um, I will often use the example of the um, Prime Minister's uh, um, daughter, Neve, who was born a couple of years ago. And for that generation of Pākehā females, the average life expectancy is expected to be 94 which means that almost half of that generation will live to be 100. Those are extraordinary futures to consider. And so we have both an immediate and a long-term uh, challenge in front of us in terms of that aging population. As you can see there, I've actually chosen something as a graphic from the UK, um, but it is a challenge that I think we all face as aging societies, uh, the, how do we cater for people's needs given this aging population? Thank you, next slide. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is the um, project, uh, population profile and the labor force participation. And the labor force participation is a, a significant issue uh, for us because it is going to increase in terms of the number of peoples in their 60s and 70s and possibly their 80s who will still be in paid employment. What I've done on the left-hand slide is look at the population 2015 and you can see that bulge uh, where I've arrowed which is the baby boomers beginning to reach their 50s and 60s. And so on the uh, right-hand side we are looking at the population by the way um, um, Stephanie mentioned the work that we're doing about the diversity and of course age diversity is part of that diversity and we're looking at that diversity in 2038 simply because it happens to be well it should be a census year and you can look there at the projections and you can look at the the numbers the expansion of the populations aged over 65 and in particular the population aged 75 and over and then the increasing numbers who will be in what we rather indelicately call the old, old population, which is those aged over 85. The dark area that surrounds them is the anticipated proportion of the population who are not in the labor force. So the, the lighter area is the labor force, and then we've got the dark area that is not in the, in the labor force. Thank you, the next slide. And this is what it looks like. Again, we've gone back to the, the, the um, census date of 2031. On the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the, um, the numbers in age groups uh, who, uh, aged over 65, I beg your pardon, um, in the various populations in New Zealand. And then I've used this on, on various occasions, but I think it's a very graphic example of the impact of the aging population. The red areas in the map to the right are where at least 30% of the population are aged over 65. The light um, red areas or the pink areas are where between 26 and 29% of the population are aged over 65. So you can see the transition from the left hand map and that's dark blue and light blue areas to the right hand map where the um, the the light, well, the light blue and the very light blue areas actually become a minority in New Zealand. So many parts of the, um, the, the New Zealand population, uh, New Zealand, I beg your pardon, um, uh, many parts of the New Zealand and its regions will be seeing a population that is aged over 65, which is between 30 and 40% of its population. Can I make a general point here? And it's an obvious one. And you, as people who work in this sector, will begin to know the impacts of this. But this is something that we've never encountered before in human history. So we've had particular communities, um, confined communities, in which the population aged over 65 will be high. But we're really here talking about regions. And so it becomes a very significant challenge, both as a country and in terms of regions. Next slide, please. 
So this is the impact. Um, already we are seeing though some regions, Thames, Coromandel, Kapitiko, Otago, in which at least over 30%, uh, at least 30% of the population are aged over 65. Within the next five years, Whanganui and the West Coast will uh, catch up with that. And it really highlights um, the concentration or the, uh, the provision of services. So these are going to be the regions which first encounter some of the challenges that I'm going to now um, talk about. But I've just picked out one example so that 40% of the population in the Minamatu Whanganui area are ratepayers on fixed incomes. The majority of those are now on a superannuation income. And so there have become fundamental questions about how you continue to provide services and facilities for a population that is on a fixed income. So there are some significant pay issues. How do we afford to provide new services? And I'm going to highlight now um, some of the challenges around that. Thank you. Next slide. So let's go back to something that I highlighted before. I think that we need to think about aging in a quite a different way to the way in which we've um, talked about it before. In the literature, and in going back to the Economist uh, special report on dementia, they talk about Japan. And of course, Japan is the most advanced uh, society in terms of aging of any society. And they talk about demographic imbalance. I would like to move us away from that uh, terminology, which implies somehow that there is a problem or that it is a, has negative consequences. It might do, but it doesn't need to. And so what we want to do, I think, is pick up the way in which baby boomers are beginning to redefine aging and how they operate as older New Zealanders and begin to um, think about the way in which we talk about these issues and to move away from the language which problematizes aging. We shouldn't think about it in that way, but we do need to exercise choices and we need to exercise those choices collectively. And I want to talk about some of those um, challenges in front of us. There are very new consumption and leisure patterns. I would want to talk about the silver economy, for example, the way in which older New Zealanders are are, are spending their money, the way in which their, um, their leisure activities are quite different. Um, for example, and it's, it's, a, it's a banal one, but let me just um, highlight it anyway. Um, uh, the, the, the bike trails that have uh, emerged around New Zealand have really reflected the way in which baby boomers are beginning to take part in particular leisure activities. Earlier this year, I did the Alps to Ocean um, with my wife. And I must say the majority of the people doing the Alps to Ocean from Mount Cook to Omaru and um, bike trail were people like us. Thank you, the next slide. Does this matter as a society? Well, yes, it should do, because what we want to do is talk about entry and exit ratios or dependency ratios. Now, entry and exit ratios are the people normally about to enter the workforce and the exit ratios are the people about to exit the workforce. So that's one way of looking at the, um, the dependency ratio in New Zealand. The dependency ratio is the people who are in paid employment compared to those who are dependents. And they're not all, of course, people aged over 65. Uh, we also have uh, young people, people in education, people on welfare of various sorts. Now, how do I calculate this? Well, what I would like to do is suggest that we, um, and, and some of this uh, terminology is still a little problematic, but look at people aged over 65 who are essentially consumers, who consume superannuation, who consume health services, who consume in various ways. So they're not receiving a income from paid employment versus the workers of all ages. Now, already a quarter of all people aged over 65 are is still in paid employment. So they would fall into the right-hand category, not the left-hand category. At the moment, uh, that ratio between the consumers is 36 to 100. So we're beginning to edge up there. And again, this is not something that we've seen in the past. Again, when I was growing up, we would have a ratio of around four people in paid employment to people who are dependent. 
And then the other ratio is the 0 to 15 to 65 plus ratio. And as you can see there, we've moved from that 4 to 1 ratio, which also equates with the dependency ratio, through to 2030, where it is almost one for one. This is such a significant change, we really need to consider a, a number of issues that begin to emerge as we see this ratio between younger New Zealanders and older New Zealanders change. Next slide. So this is to reinforce the workforce participation rate. Um, in 2015, it was 22%, it is now 25%, and we anticipate it to continue to increase and so you can see there in 2038 uh, that between um, a, a participation rate of 19 to 31%, so that will be a, somewhere between 250,000 and 400,000 people aged over 65 will still be in the workforce. And as you can see in the other column, it will make up between 9 and 13% of the workforce. So it's, it's quite a significant shift, but we should acknowledge that 65 here really does not mean uh, retirement. It won't, and it certainly won't in the future. Next slide. So coming back to the longevity, um, the point here really is to uh, pick up the Grattan and Scott, the 100-year life, that our lives will be much longer than has historically been the case, longer than the role models on which we currently base decisions. We will move from a young dominant society in which the young co younger cohorts were dominant, the one that is old dominant. Um, as I pointed out before, um, the practice life expectancy does not anticipate any plateau in this increasing life expectancy uh, in the future. Uh, that we will see, in fact, the largest household growth will be adults living alone, and that will be adults without children, but it will also be single adults. And one of the things we're beginning to see is the way in which um, households are changing, in which we look uh, at households as those which care for children, but which increasingly care for older people. And so one of the things that is apparent in the literature, and there's a very good book by Camilla Cavendish called Extra Time, 10 Lessons for an Aging World, in which um, she talks about the way in which we care for people. And when we're going to come in a moment to um, long-term care for elder people, then about 40% of that takes place in homes in which there is what is called informal care, in which um, families will care for older people, particularly those who, who need some sort of um, help. Thank you, next slide. So can we just talk briefly about this, because one of the challenges we have is, I'm going to talk about long-term care facilities in a moment. One of the things that we need to acknowledge is that the family still is a very significant part of the care that is provided for older people. And that might include those who are simply still active, but are wanting to live with members of the family, through to those who might need specialist care of various sorts, including dementia. And um, what we've seen is a very significant uh, shift in terms of the structure of families. And the families that I was talking about a moment ago are beanpole families, which have multi-generational families. Those are growing alongside the um, single person household. So we, we're seeing quite different types of households and therefore families beginning to emerge. Um, New Zealand has some of the highest rates of household change of any country in the OECD. We have the highest rate of growth for single person households. We also have some of the highest rates of separation and reconstituted families. And so we're seeing very different families beginning to emerge, including the care of people in family units where the members of the family are not related biologically. Thank you, next slide. And just to reinforce this, this is the uh, marriage and divorce rates between 1961 and 2019. As you, as you can see there, some of the core things that in the past we would have expected to provide some sort of institutional care and provision 
are actually changing and it does impact upon how we age and also how we care for older people. Thank you, next slide. So one of the things that will begin to impact upon the provision of care is the increase in the old, old population, those aged over 85. In fact, the percentage growth of the 85 plus population will be one of the most rapid. And as you can see, it will grow in New Zealand from 83,000 to 264,000. And the people aged over 100 will double by 2030. One of the things that um, the report on the right, which came out uh, about a month or two ago, which is the world popular population aging, and it's sort of something that if you've not read, I think it's something I would certainly encourage you to look at. But how do we calculate the uh, longevity of people in New Zealand? I am moving away from whole of life um, uh, expectations about longevity to years of life remaining at age 65. And so when we look at those in 2018, what's really, really interesting is that in New Zealand, for, for um, uh, males, it will be uh, um, uh, extra years of life at age 65 is 19.6 years, and for females, it's 21.6 years. And as you can see alongside that, that um, equates to Japan, slightly higher female uh, longevity uh, or remaining years of life at age 65 for Japan. But as you can see, when, it, when you compare with other countries, and I've picked two at random, the USA and a Scandinavian country, because we often think about the Scandinavians as being uh, major investors in care, then you can see the, um, the impacts of it. And um, it, it really does impact upon the development and the growth of the people who will need care. So can I just draw your attention to that uh, economist um, special report on dementia, uh, in which they talk about the exponential growth of uh, people with dementia simply because of an aging population, that the aging population is going to produce a much larger um, uh, group of people who will have dementia of various sorts. Next slide. So we do need to talk about those new demands and we do need to talk about those new costs. Um, what we're heading into is a period in which the costs, even the current costs of aging are going to keep on increasing. And the, the, um, the issue is that our tax revenue begins to decline. So as we move the balance between the people who are in work and the people who are aged over 65, then we simply don't have um, the numbers who are generating tax revenue that we can then spend on the increasing costs of an aging population. And there is a paradox here, and that is that the numbers aged over 65, the numbers who are going to need um, superannuation, the numbers who are going to need care, is increasing at the very moment that our workforce is beginning to shrink because of um, the shrinkage in fertility and the shrinkage in the number of younger people in, the, in um, uh, prime work and age conditions. So we have a fundamental crisis in front of us that we need to talk about. We should be talking about the superannuation and whether we want to means test it, whether we want to increase the age of eligibility, whether we want to stagger it as the French do between uh, those who might need um, superannuation at an earlier age compared with those who, who don't need that. Um, do we begin, do we continue to pay uh, superannuation to those who are still in paid work? Can I come to the old age health provision and I want to talk about long-term care, the LTC there. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to point out that um, uh, when you look at New Zealand and when you look at inequality, that inequality is growing. And the, and the graph to the right, which is after tax incomes between 1982 and 2018, really does point out that the rich 10% are doing better and better compared to the poorest 10% and the middle 10%. And so we need to acknowledge that there are issues around 
inequality in New Zealand as well. Thank you. Next slide. Long-term care. This is one issue that I just want to pick up because it's one of those um, issues that highlights the challenges in front of us. Um, in 2020, in this year, about 4% of the people aged over 65 are in long-term care. And that, of course, goes up depending upon age. In six years, we will need an additional 12,000 long-term care facilities, beds, and it might be as high as 20,000. Are we prepared for this? How are we going to pay for this? Who's going to provide this? Um, at the moment, uh, it is largely um, state provided. Can that afford, can we afford that? And what I've got there is the um, the New Zealand experience of long-term care. It's increasing at a, just under 5% per annum, but that compares with GDP growth, and, and there are issues around GDP growth um, and calculating it that way, but just let's stick with that of 2%. So it is more than double, it is growing at more than double the rate of our economy per year. And so we are going to hit these walls. And uh, going back to dementia provision, one of the things that strikes me is that very often the people who are providing dementia care are those who are, um, well, first of all, it's often described as, 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 as um, low-skilled care. And when we look at it, um, we realize that the workforce is going to need to increase, I'm just sticking with dementia for the moment, increase by a factor which is very, very significant. Um, so quite often the people that are in this sector at the moment are described as low skilled and they're not particularly well paid, but they need empathy, they need patience and they need kindness. So when we look at a country like Japan, which is experiencing this way ahead of us, in 2020, the elder care workforce, not simply dementia, but the elder care workforce in Japan is 1.5 million people. Over the next decade, that workforce will need to increase by a factor of seven to cater for elder care in Japan. And by 2030, 10% of all workers will be in the elder care workforce. That's the sort of challenge that countries like Japan, which are 20 to 30 years ahead of us, are experiencing. And so what we need to then consider is, as we see dementia increase, what are we going to do in terms of um, dementia-friendly and dementia-appropriate services? Thank you. Um, can I just finish up now? Will COVID-19 alter these demographic shifts? Um, well, they will. Uh, for the next two to three years, at least, we will see minimal immigration. In fact, it will be mostly returning New Zealanders and therefore much slower growth. That will um, diminish the numbers coming in uh, in terms of diversity of our, our population as a result of immigration. However, the Asian population, because of its age profile, its median age, uh, the numbers in the prime um, working age groups, the numbers who uh, will have children, will increase that diversity. What COVID-19 will do is underscore the aging of this society because it will dampen down fertility. It will increase the regional impacts, particularly stagnation and decline, and it will highlight, as we've seen through COVID-19, the vulnerability of older populations, and you can see that around the world. And I've got um, a, um, a uh, uh, a brochure uh, there which uh, has been circulated around the world in terms of the higher risk of older adults. Thank you. Now, can I just make a very quick point about the global population? Global population is expected to grow through, 20, the 20, through to the 2060s and then decline. So there are short-term issues I've been talking about what will happen between now and 2030, what will happen between now and 2040. But what we should expect through the century is a decline in population. And can I just, there will be 23 countries who are expected by the end of the century to have halved their population. Now I've just picked out some there, Japan, Spain, Italy, Poland, and Thailand. 
they will see their population halve. Unless something dramatic changes, and it's difficult to think what that would be, it's going to be a very interesting population. And then China will be the first population to age before it grows rich. Thank you. So let's rehearse this, my points. A new demography, a new New Zealand will emerge because of this dominant growth of the over 65s. We are going to have some challenges and those challenges will be of cost, but also of where we get our workforce from. Immigration and aging will characterize population growth for the next two decades. If we have lower immigration, we will have more aging. We will have fewer skilled workers. So I would want to connect the two. Thank you. And this is my last slide. And I really want to pose some questions for those of you who are in the workshops at this point. Have we thought about, are we considering the social needs of an aging society at this point? Because it is a quantum shift and entering territory that we've never uh, encountered before. And alongside those social needs are the physical needs. I've been really, really impressed by some of the, uh, the developments that you see in parts of Europe, in the Netherlands, for example, or in parts of Japan, uh, where the way in which the community is being changed. And there are, I mentioned before, the um, um, dementia without walls, the way in which areas of cities are being made dementia friendly. And that raises a fundamental question in terms of our community infrastructure and planning. Are we actually preparing for an aging society in terms of our community infrastructure? Um, some years ago, we looked at Auckland and we asked the question on behalf of Auckland Transport, was the transport infrastructure appropriate to an aging population? And the answer was no. That the, the, the transport, including the transport planning, really did not consider the transport needs of an older population. There are going to be some challenging questions about costs and how we capture the opportunities in terms of an aging population. Those costs are going to go up very considerably as the population ages. And so are we considering those? Are we considering best practice? And I think we're looking at the, um, looking at the people that have provided um, papers and um, presentations to the conference that was originally planned. My answer is I'm heartened by the way in which people are considering this, but I still want to ask the question about whether we are incorporating best practice locally and internationally. And my final question here is, what concerns me most is whether our policy innovation system is up to the task of considering very different options from the ones that have existed in the past. As part of that, and we're very close to a, an election, my concern is that our political system and the way in which we have a three-year cycle, the way in which we're not considering medium and long-term issues is really counterproductive but thinking about the policy shifts that are going to be that are going to be needed for an aging society. I regard this, and this is my final note, I regard this as an opportunity, as a way in which we should consider and engage using evidence to, um, to, to confront, to engage with these um, issues. They are significant issues. They're ones that we've never encountered before. Um, but it is an exciting moment. But Will we be able to capture the best practice and the opportunities that this provides us with? And are we going to get the policy innovation that we deserve? Kia ora tata katoa. Kia ora, and thank you so much, Paul, for that. That's an amazing um, reflection on the world that we see. I have two comments actually, and the comments really are that now is time to work together and we've worked together really well here. 
uh, Aging Well. The, the, our, our conference is a collaboration of two organisations that come together to look at ageing in the future and ageing today. We have um, uh, an organisation known as Age Concern is now, now 70 years old. 70 years ago would be a quite a different look of our older community as it is today. And you are so right. We have to be able to do things differently. We have got a wonderful community that can help us and we can help all the people that need us. So age concerns are around New Zealand. We have 40 offices and what you have already alluded to many parts of the country that we are in. I want to know is how we can help our community do things better, age better. So thank you so much for that reflection and that, that sharing of that. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it just as much as I did. So now I'd like to welcome Greg Ward. Greg um, actually is someone who's known to us for a few years now. Greg came on board um, in our 2018 conference and um, the first line of his statement that I'm about to read out really does explain Greg. Greg is a award-winning gentleman who lives and breathes conferences and events and can make it happen. So as a professional MC, he has facilitated, moderated, hosted, and performed over a thousand events. Today, we are going to hear more about moments that matter, the power of now. Thank you, Greg. Kia ora, Stephanie. Inga iwi, inga mana, inga waka, inga hoe fa, hairi mai, hairi mai, hairi mai. Ko Pukitei Tere Tamonga, ko Waitakari Taua, ko Ngati Paki Ati Iwi, ko Air New Zealand DC 8 in 1972, Toko Waka, ko Greg Ward Aho. Kia ora tato, kia ora whanau. It's an absolutely wonderful moment to be standing here in front of you on this, the day of the International Day of the Older Person. And of course, this is the opening of our Vision for Aging at Aotearoa. A massive thank you, of course, uh, to our uh, platinum sponsor, Perpetual Garden, as well for uh, allowing us the support to be able to do this too. Well, I'm here to talk about this, Moments That Matter, the power of now. And this is a very, very special time for me right now in terms of uh, age. Um, my father is 80 years old. He turned 80 this year. And very unfortunately, we lost three days ago my auntie, who was 85 and was the matriarch of the family, which leaves my father now in the position of being the oldest member of our family. And having the experience of guiding and helping him through the process uh, as we are going through over these last few days has been particularly enlightening in, in how we deal with relationships as well. So there's certainly elements that are happening right now for me in this space uh, that talk directly to what we're doing. My role here is to highlight exactly how important present moment awareness is right now. And to do so, I'm gonna tell you some stories. I'm gonna take you back uh, to a conference or maybe a couple of conferences, but before I do that, part of this presentation, I'll be touching on elements of mental health and of wellness and so forth. So before I get into those elements, what I always like to do is this, if anything that I say here causes any form of distress or brings up anything for you, if there's any challenges in terms of, if you feel that you may be in danger of causing harm for yourself or for others, triple one, 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 one is the call and the number to immediately call. If throughout you find yourself needing some further support, we have the New Zealand Telehealth line there, 1737, and you can text that or phone that from any mobile phone and you'll be connected with a trained counsellor at that particular point in time. I'm not envisaging going in too particularly deep, but it's always very relevant to be able to say something like this at that point. So I'm going to head across now to a conference that I was at in 2019, and I recall this really clearly. In this particular moment, I'm sitting at the back of the room, and I've just introduced the keynote speaker onto the stage. And as I'm doing so, I'm watching him begin to take this audience on a journey. And I realize something right in that moment, that I want to be up there on that stage doing that, right there. Now that's probably sounding a little strange in conjunction with the introduction that Stephanie has just given. I mean, I live on the stage. This is my happy space. I l absolutely love it. Uh, as I pointed out, I've, I've officiated uh, over a thousand events, half a million people I've in some way impacted over the course of my career across 35 countries, uh, both live and virtual. Um, but 
also I'm an entertainer, an actor and performer, a multi-instrumentalist musician, and I've done all of these things. And I'm not saying these to impress. What I am saying is none of that matters. It's gone. It's in the past. We cannot change that. It's done. What we do have is this, this moment, this shared moment that we're all experiencing here together right now, never to be repeated. And I can absolutely guarantee this, right? We were never, ever going to have the same experience in the same way, in the same place ever again. This is our present. And what we choose to do with this moment here right now has a significant bearing on the focus and direction of our lives from this moment forward. So there I am, I'm sitting at the back of the room. And then the speaker does something unexpected. He calls for a volunteer to join him on stage. So he's teaching people how to do this. And I realize that he's talking directly to me right here in this moment. This is my opportunity. This is my chance. And I can feel the excitement rise. But at the same time, I feel this pang of fear. And it hits me right in the middle of my chest. Now, I've experienced stage nerves. I mean, this is part and parcel of what I do as a performer and as a speaker. I love that as well. I relish the, the elements of uh, the excitement and the nervousness that comes in, that little frisson of excitement. And it keeps you really sharp. But this was different. This was primeval. It was deep. This was the fear of a paradigm shift. This is the fear of change, of going from a comfort zone up to a learning zone. And in this moment of fear, I hesitated. And in my hesitation, another audience member raises his hand, gets up and takes my position on stage. Now I am seething. And I hope, I mean, I just hope that, that Steve, who's the speaker, is going to give the audience another opportunity to come and join him on stage as well. But uh, in all things, and very much like parachuting, hope is not a strategy. So instead of hoping, I set an intention. And this is a critical thing. Intention setting is a very, very powerful tool in terms of dealing with elements of a moment or a pivotal moment. This chap is, is uh, Peter Goldwitzer, and he's a German psychologist who's working in the United States, and he's the authority on intention setting. The beautiful thing about this, and it's certainly with the human mind, is that the subconscious really doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. So by visualizing and setting yourself a set of steps that you will follow when those moments occur, has a very, very powerful effect, and it actually creates synapses uh, for you to uh, follow. And so I decide that I will set an intention. If I get another opportunity, if the speaker asks for another audience member, I will raise my hand. I will stand up from my chair. I will move forward in that room. See, it's not just the recognition of these moments these pivotal moments in our life that is important and you will recognize a pivotal moment. It's one of those things where you will feel forced to make a decision. You will be almost compelled to do something different. And once you've made the decision, you will be forced to act upon that decision as well. So it's not the days and weeks and months of training and studying and learning. It's the moments in our life that define us. And in doing so, they transform us. They transform the way we act, those day, they transform the way we behave, and they transform our view of the world. So this was one of those moments where I had the opportunity to be able to take, take this moment and then run forward with it. Now, the thing about this, about moments, is that I already understood this through the work that I've been doing in behavior, uh, with all of the work I do in stage and entertainment and, on, and performance and speaking, um, I am a student of human behavior. I'm insanely curious about it. Uh, I, I urge you to be insanely curious about human behavior. That's, that's the, the aspect for me. But to do so, the first thing is you need to be insanely curious 
about yourself. So I'd like to ask you this, take a, a moment and I want you to think about a moment where you found yourself in a similar situation where you had a pivotal moment happen for you, but you found yourself freezing in that moment. Just have a think. I don't want you to reveal it. I don't need to know it. Just so you're thinking about it. Because I realized what I was doing in that moment. I was making a choice. I was actively choosing to stay exactly as I was. I was choosing to remain at the status quo. I was actively pushing away this opportunity for change. Because that's what we do in these moments that matter. We freeze. And when we do, we are pushing away the opportunity for change. We are making ourselves unwilling to take a risk. We are making ourselves unwilling to fail. And ultimately, we are choosing to remain exactly the same. Now, what's quite ironic about all of this is that through the work that I've done, particularly as an actor training in one-to-one in -one, uh, transactions in the Meisner technique, is that I understand how to do this, but I allowed that knowledge to bypass me in the heat of that moment. Because the key is to get out of your head, to focus externally, to listen, to listen with every single fiber of your being, to listen at 100 million miles an hour, to listen to the sound of the moment, the beat of the world around us, the ebb and flow of connection and conversation. Now you're probably thinking, well, what's he doing? What's he gonna say now? The thing is this, you could have done anything in the 11 seconds that passed between my last statement and this portion of the speech. You could have started thinking about the grocery list of items that you need to get a little later today. You could be thinking about the work that you have to do. You could be thinking about the, the connections that you need to um, uh, connect up with, the people you need to connect up with a little later on today. But I would wager that you probably did none of those because you were here right here in this space, in this moment. And that is the level of attention that you need to be able to connect when those moments that matter arrive. And it's in that state, awake, alive, and aware to every single possibility that you're able to not only react instantly and accurately to the moments that matter around you, but you're able to set in place a fertile playing field to actively create moments in other people and those people that you care about. And that's a really, really crucial thing. That, <laughs> yes, that is a picture of a baby gorilla. <laughs> yes, you're dead right. Uh, I will just pass directly over that and move to this. And I'll tell you the reason I gave you the picture of the baby gorilla right there. There is a psychological effect that is really important when we're doing things like this. And I want to anchor something in your mind. And what I want to anchor is now is the key. If you won't hear it from me, or if you find it challenging to hear this from me, Eckhart Tolle, who is an international expert in this area of business, he says presence is the key, now is the key. We use this, and I'll go back to the gorilla. You will remember this gorilla. And the reason you remember it is a thing called the von Restorf effect. And it happens like this. When you have a homogenous group of items, if you have one item that is a standout, such as five blue milk bottle tops and then one red milk bottle top, you'll remember the red one. So you're gonna remember this gorilla, but also equally, you will remember what it is connected to. And that is this, now is the key. And that's an absolutely integral part of what I'm talking about here present moment awareness, listening with every single fiber of your being and allowing yourself to be impacted by this, the moment that we are sharing right here together. So I'm gonna take you back to that room in Auckland. So I'm sitting at the back of the room and we get through halfway through the presentation and Steve does this again, Steve's the speaker. He says, 
can we have another audience member? And I, my arm is in the air. I'm out of my seat. I'm halfway down the room before I even realize that I'm doing this. Now, because I'm the MC, he thinks that there's something wrong. <laughs> he doesn't realize that I'm actually responding to his call. But I do nonetheless. And I'm up halfway through the room and he says, okay, oh, it's you, Greg. Cool. So we get on the stage and then he guides me through a series of exercises and I'm, I'm working, presenting to the room. And during that process, I suddenly realize that this is it. I have spent 25 years standing behind lecterns as an MC, basically using a lectern as a shield. It's my suit of armor. But from that moment, never again, I chose to be me in that space. So I released this Greg, this, the, the Greg who has something to say on stage. One of the things that my old acting teacher used to say when I was training and studying as an actor was that to tell the truth from the stage is one of the most powerful things you can do as a human being. And it doesn't matter whether that truth is, is ugly or achingly beautiful. If it is the truth and it's well told, all you will ever receive is applause. And we were very thankfully showered with applause in that particular state there. So I realized that that was a very, very powerful moment. That has been one of the catalysts for why I'm standing right here, right now. I want to take you to another conference. I'll do that directly after this piece here, because the work that I've been doing over the course of the last couple of years has involved me looking at people's ability to react to the moments that arrive around them. And I've broken these down into four areas, and I'd like to share them with you right now. The first of these is called unconscious inaction. So this is individuals who are unable to actually see opportunity around them. They can't even see the moments as they are arriving in towards them. They tend to go through life looking down. They don't tend to worry about the future or the past. It's just simply what's happening around them, uh, but they can't see levels of opportunity. This is in the state of unconscious inaction. They think themselves, well, they believe in luck, but essentially it's because they feel themselves to be particularly unlucky because their focus is not outwards enough for them to be able to find those moments and react to those moments. The second of these I call conscious inaction. And this is where you understand that you can see moments happening around you, but you're still finding it very difficult to make those decisions to act upon the moments as they come in. And so one of those things might be Perhaps you're in a grocery store and you see there's one item left on the shelf and you're not sure whether or not you want to grab that. But as you're thinking about it, somebody else comes and grabs it. There's decisions there. Maybe there's a, an opportunity for a, a growth within, a, within an organization, uh, but you are too worried about what may happen if you take it. And as a consequence, somebody else takes that as well. That's people there in the state of conscious inaction. And you can probably tell these people, they say should, could, would a lot. I should have done that. Oh, I wish I would have done that. I wish I, wish I could have done that. It's about the shoulds and coulds. The third state I call conscious action. Conscious action is a great place to be. It's where you're realizing that you have the opportunity to be able to act upon those moments as they arrive. And you're actively doing it, but it still takes time and effort to push through that fear. It's a process, but you are getting there. So with it, it's conscious action. You're understanding more about who you are and the world around you. And the fourth of these states is what I call transformative action. And transformative action is where it's effortless. You're able to simply and accurately act upon the moments as they arrive and live directly right there. If you make a decision and you find that it's not necessarily the best decision, you're able to quickly and swiftly change that decision. It's not hugely emotional. You're not, not fully, uh, completely overwhelmed with it. You're able to move and flow within those four areas. So that is the four states that I've identified here. Unconscious inaction, conscious inaction, conscious action, and transformative action. So here's the question 
for you. A couple of questions. I don't want to know the answers to these. This is simply for you. The first of these is this. Out of those four states, where do you see yourself fit? In which of those states do you reside? Just have a think about that for a moment. And the second question that I have, again, I don't want to know the answer to this. This is for you. Are you where you need to be? So just have a think about that for a moment. And one of the things that I also want to talk about with the element of being completely here, completely in this moment, is this. I want to offer a challenge to you all. So when you leave from this set of webinars, when you go off and you communicate and connect with other people, people who are important to you in your life, I want you to give them the attention that you gave me in that 11 seconds to listen with every part of your being, not to listen to respond, uh, not to listen to say the next line that you're thinking of in your head, but to listen and understand what it is they actually have to say. And I don't want you to do it for just 11 seconds. I want you to do it for as long as they need. For as long as they need. So coming back to the four action states here, if you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm in one of those states, but I need to be somewhere else. I'm going to simplify this because it's sometimes easy to become overwhelmed with the challenges that we have in our lives. And it doesn't matter at what age we have these. But the research shows that as we get older, we become more entrenched in our own way of thinking. And it's a very important thing for us, for us all, to be able to understand that and as a consequence, do something about it as well. And so I came across this very simple little piece which I think is quite a powerful thing. Life is simple. Are you happy? Yes, keep going. No, change something. Back to are you happy? Very simple. It is a, it is a, a extremely simplistic look at the world, I know. But that at its essence is the simplest part of this. If we live in the moment, we don't worry about the future, we don't uh, dwell on the past, but we live here we're able to swiftly make these decisions. And it comes down to a great deal about mindset. I had the great pleasure of working with this uh, lovely person. This is uh, Professor Carol S. Dweck, and uh, she works out of Stanford University. She came up with the concept of mindset uh, and has proposed that we have two forms of mindset, growth mindset and a fixed mindset. People with a growth mindset understand that failure is important to understand that the risk is important, to understand that they don't have to win all the time. It's a matter of continuing and uh, uh, continual growth. I had the great pleasure of touring on a roadshow on a three day uh, tour, tour around New Zealand uh, with Carol and team. And it was illuminating the elements that she was able to provide. She says, becoming is better than being. So regardless of where we are within our lives, it's the continual striving for growth, for something new. And I was having a conversation with my father, as I said, 80 years old, and he's throughout his whole life, he's always found ways to find new things to do, to create, to build, to move forward. And we were talking about his parents and his parents' generation. And the interesting and challenging fact was that they were passing away around the age of 67, 68, 69, between that and the, and the early 70s. They would retire and then do nothing. My father is plowing on because he's finding interesting things to do. And I think this is a, an indicative thing for, for our senior generations to come in and actually continue to learn, to grow, to build, but live here, to not dwell on the past, to not worry about the future, but to live right here in the present moment in time. I'll take you now through to another conference. And I mentioned that I'd probably go to two conferences. This conference happened prior to the one I mentioned earlier, but it had a huge amount of impact for me. And I had been working like a million miles an hour on many different events. And my whole ethos as an MC has always been to be, it's about you. How can I help you? What can I do for you? 
putting all of my energy outwards. And so I'd been going from conference to event to conference to event with very little time worrying, not even thinking about myself to a great extent, uh, but not giving myself as much attention as I needed to do. So I got to this particular conference the following morning, uh, we were getting prepared for the start. The conference had three themes, diversity, performance, and well-being. And the convener came and saw me and said, Greg, look, uh, I, want to, I want you to do me a favor. And I said, sure, I'm the MC, whatever, I can do it. I'm going to do it, absolutely do it. Now, he said, we don't have a closing keynote speaker for our conference. I'm going to do a piece, it's going to be 15 minutes long, and I'm wondering if you could join me on stage and do a piece around about 15 minutes long uh, to fill in this half hour slot at the end. And he's going to talk about, he said he'll talk about anxiety, something that he went through. And of course, as in my role, I said, absolutely, yes, no problem at all, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. He was asking me to speak about well being, and what he didn't know was that. The previous night after I'd arrived, in the early hours of the morning, through a haze of alcohol, I had attempted to take my life. I'm very proud that, that in almost everything I achieve, I'm incredibly successful. However, I'm very pleased indeed that I was not successful in that particular case. But the joking aside, I was in crisis in that morning, and he was asking me to speak about well-being. I could not reveal this to him. I felt it was just not, not, not able to. So I decided to come up with a, with a fairly pat story that would uh, help. So I went into that process and got to the end of the conference after a couple of days and we got on stage. He told his story, it was beautiful. It was an amazing story of resilience and pushing through in terms of his ability to uh, get through his own anxiety issues. And while he spoke, I realized that I could not tell my fairly pat story as well. And for the very first time in my life, I stood on a stage and began to reveal the truth of what goes on for me. The very high highs, the very low lows, the long nights, the loneliness of the hotels, that, and all of the elements that were contributing to the challenges that I was having from, from a mental space. And when I walked off that stage, someone touched me on the arm and I turned, it was a young lady, and she said to me, Greg, thank you for saying that. I thought I was the only one. And that moment, that moment was a catalyst of change for me to realize that the experience that I'd had and my ability to stand here on stages and do this had an incredibly powerful effect and could be used for good. And so I started and began this process of being able to translate this and, and stand on stage and speak to create the moment that I'd high had and hopefully create that moment in for other people as well. So I've come up with a few resilience strategies, which are really important. And I think this is one of the factors that we find is we talk a lot about our youth in terms of suicide prevention. And we talk a lot about my age group in terms of suicide prevention, but not what a lot of people know out there in the great, greater world is that our third highest group of people are men over 80 who are at risk of suicide. So the resilience strategies I've got here, are really simple kind of things, moderate or avoid alcohol, very simple. <laughs> Engage in an exercise routine, so 30 minutes at least every three times a week, uh, focusing on that. And it's great because you're creating micro goals, you're actually getting in physica physicality and you're keeping yourself fit. Really important part of my own routines. Maintaining a nutritional balance, making sure you've got your, uh, a good mix of food. Uh, nutritional supplements if, supplements if you need them, such as vitamin B6 or omega-3, fish oils and the like. B6 has been shown to give some really good efficacy against uh, anxiety. Aiming for eight hours sleep a night, and I know that our sleep patterns change as we age. That's just a normal process. But, the, but being able to focus and find methods of uh, creating sleep in you is a really valuable thing too. Great tools out on the internet for that as well, and I'm happy to share too. And the final one here that I use is taking time to focus on gratitude. It's very challenging in itself to be in a depressed or anxious state if you are focusing on someone else for something good they did for you. And this chap here, Martin Seligman, who is the creator of positive psychology, he has a, a gratitude exercise. And that is, you find somebody who did something great for you in your life, who is still alive, and you write them a 300 word letter, then you give them a call and ask to go and visit them. And when you arrive at their space, you read them that letter. And I've got somebody in mind, I really, really need to uh, 
thank for something they did for me many, many, many years ago. And I'm still trying to locate him. And I will locate him, and I'm going to go through that process, which I'm looking forward to very, very much indeed. So thank you very much indeed for your time. This is Moments That Matter, The Power of Now. And I'm going to leave you with this. The past is gone. We cannot change it. The future is uncertain. We cannot rely on it. All we have is now, the present moment. Live now. Kia ora whanau. Thank you. Kia ora, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing those words. It's interesting, isn't it, the power of now? Now, I'm thinking about that as I sit in my room, away from my family, my friends, my colleagues in the office, and they're watching this by themselves without me, that it's really important to be thankful for the opportunities that have been presented to us today, to have you here, to have the other speakers involved, to have the support of everyone who's watching to make a difference to our seniors for the future and to support us. Thank you, everybody. Oof. We're almost there. We're almost at the end of our two hour session. The next component of our two hour session will be a a breakout session for everybody. Now, if anybody hasn't uh, agreed to participate, I think there was a, a something that went out to accept, so please accept that. We have four fantastic facilitators who will be running each of these sessions. You'll be randomly put with a facilitator. That opportunity will come very, very soon. I want to thank Nairi Curse. Nairi Curse is um, her, the uh, president of the NZAG at the moment of the New Zealand Association of Gerontology. Thank you so much for all the great work you do. Kathy Glasgow, thank you so much. You'll be another facilitator. Sally Hippenstall, thank you too for your help and support today. And Lara Vizlista, and my apologies for your name. Thank you so much as well today for your support with us. Those four facilitators will be waiting at the end of the session to welcome you to facilitate. Reminders that you will be able to ask questions by using the, um, the raising your hands and through the chat, the chat process. Um, the, the, each facilitator will go through their, quest, their things when you arrive in the room and go through the questions. Really enjoy that, that, that discussion. Don't hesitate to interrupt, to give your opinion, to share your thoughts and to add your comments. At the end of that, we will all come back together so we can all say goodbye, thank our supporters again, and then get on with our day. So please, everybody, enjoy your sessions now. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm, I, I've, I shared some time in a breakout room with, with uh, Kathy and the team there, and it was a really great conversation. I hope you all enjoyed that and had met new friends, um, heard uh, some other people's perspectives and point of view, and we'll hopefully have a good friendship for the, leaving the, the webinar today. So thank you for doing that. Now, we're almost at the end of that two hours. I can't believe it's gone so quickly. Um, I was very nervous to start with because this is a new technology for us, because this is a new way of doing something. Also because we were so sad to see the, uh, our conference change its shape several times. But what was really wonderful is people stayed with us, supported us, continued to have conversations with us, continued to tell us that we were, um, we had the right, the right approach, that we were doing the right thing. And we've all been going through the washing machine of COVID. So I think that out the other end here, um, in October, running the, the Vision for Aging in Aotearoa webinar series is such a strength. It's such a community connected activity. It's, it's so good to be here and have landed. And it is so good to have had great conversations today. So thank you so much. I'll just do my final thanks to everybody. Thanks to our sponsor, Perpetual Guardian, for making this possible. Um, for the technology, the magic, magic of technology and the magic of support of technology from multimedia. Thank you again for that because this is, this is new ground for us. This is the thing that when you wonder what to do next, you need the experts in the room. Thank you so much. To those presenters, thank you. 
I really know that some of the gems that you've heard today, you'll go away with and you'll go out to the community and you'll say, I heard this today. What do you think? Or I think about this. What do you think? But underpinning all that, you will all say, happy International Day of Older Persons to everyone you meet. Thank you to the participants. You have joined us on a, uh, on a journey on this magic carpet of our vision, vision for ageing in Aotearoa. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, thank you to my team at National Office because you have weathered the washing machine storm of uh, getting this together, putting it out, coming back, going back, changing a date, what next, and you are amazing. We do this together, and I know that that's why it looks so good is because of you. So the next time I want us to all come together is next Thursday, Thursday at 10 o'clock, and we are going to talk about housing. Is there enough? Who should build? What should we have? What communities? What's available to us? Our housing panel will be full of experts that you need to be there to, to hear. So at the end of this, you'll get a registration for the next four webinar series events we've got. Every time we're going to make sure that you join us to talk again. Thank you so much. Happy International Day of Older Persons, everybody. See you soon. See you next week. <laughs>